and it probably won't be the next time. So, let's see. All right, so turn to Genesis. Chapter, anybody know what chapter that it's in? Thank you. Four. And we're going to begin in verse 16. <clears throat> Before we read it. So up to this point, we've seen the perspectives, um, <clears throat> the strongholds, the attitudes of Cain, and they, those things that have, that led to what he did against his brother. And, um, but, you know, there is the old, you reap what you sow. So tonight we're going to talk about the fallout of that. <clears throat> because that's what comes up next in the scriptures, is the fallout of what that happens. Um, but I do want to say, um, you know, whether it's Agag or Haman or Mordecai or your flesh or your own problems, however you want to put that, Jesus, Jesus is not just Lord over those things. He's supposed to be life in us. And yes, he is Lord, but he's, in a certain sense, life is more important than being Lord. Lord is him bossing us, if you will. <laughs> but life will bring forth more life. And um, the, uh, the way of Cain was more than just a, a, an event. He killed his brother. Well, it only happened. That's the only time I ever killed anybody. Well, there wasn't anybody else alive, except your parents. <clears throat> uh, the scriptures describe it as the way of Cain. And so, um, there is what we talked about last time a little bit, just to remind you of that, and that is that, this, that the Lord in these stories and what I'm trying to share <clears throat> is not just to point out problems with people. That's not the goal. The goal is never to point out problems with people, but to point out Christ in contrast to that. And we've been, and that's why most of these stories I mean, I keep referring and just saying Genesis, but it's in it's all the way through the Bible. But most of them relate to, you know, two, two people, two kinds. You could say that there are there are two people groups in the earth. Uh, no, not those who like Neil Diamond and those who don't. Uh, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about <clears throat> uh, sheep and goats. And that's why it says in the New Testament, Jesus said it, that they shall be gathered before me, all nations, and those nations will be, be of a nature that is either in the category of sheep or goats. When I was a missionary in Jamaica, part of my, pro my problem, my my responsibilities was to take care of the, the goats also. They had really cute babies. They did, didn't they? I got, got a picture of Deb holding one of the little babies. It's really cute. <clears throat> but they grow up and they, they will eat anything. They eat garbage. They do. They eat garbage. They'll, they'll eat, start eating your hubcaps. They'll, they'll, I mean, you've got to really have them you know, ex exiled away. And, hmm. All right, well, there's also special goat sounds on YouTube if you want to look them up. <laughs> and, uh, they, um, and I've always been taken with that story because I see all the nations coming before him, but in their mind, they don't know who's a sheep or who's a goat. That doesn't happen until 
Jesus divides them. But I think they get a clue when they come in and the one sitting on the throne is a lamb. <laughs> Revelation 5, lamb slain, sitting on that throne. And <clears throat> so, so there is this thing, there is this dividing that we see in every story. <clears throat> and the, the dividing isn't good and evil as we suppose uh, it is sheep or goat. It is Christ or not Christ. It is the lamb or not the lamb. It is the son of the father, the son of the father's love or not him. And in the case of those who stood before all nations that come before the Lord, <clears throat> as I said, he's not looking at um, uh, outward things because You'd be surprised, but goats and sheep have a lot in common outwardly, externally, but nature-wise, God chose to divide it based on nature. And, and he did that, again, not in terms of good or bad, because good and evil is the wrong tree, and God doesn't need of it either, but based on his son. God put his son in all those who are truly born again, and God wants him to increase. And the scriptures talk about that. Colossians talks about it, that there may, may be an increase of him. And, and John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. And so, <clears throat> so our time spent during our lifetime on this earth is to be focused on more of Jesus less of me. That should be our heart. All right. So starting in verse uh, Genesis 4, starting in verse 16, <clears throat> And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. <clears throat> and he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, I wonder if he walked around going, I read, man. Anyway, that's, I guess, for 80s people. <laughs> um, and uh, I read, begat Mehujael. Mehujael begat Mehusael. And Mehusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Ada. And the name of the other was Zillah, which I assume when they got married, she was Bridezilla. That's just, you know, uh, female Cain. Not aboard Jabel, and he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ and Zillah, she also bore Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer uh, in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naima. So, <clears throat> in verse 16, the first verse, we see that there's an, there's an exile. All right, folks, in all of these stories, there's an exile on some level almost every time. Okay, and, and as we move through it, you're going to see it over and over. And sometimes the exile is, uh, m most of the time the exile is the one who is not the firstborn. But sometimes the firstborn is exiled because God's dealing with him on a certain level. <clears throat> so it's, you just have to see it in context of the different stories that come that way. Um, and... So he, but he, uh, Cain was exiled in two different ways, okay? One was, if you look at it, he was removed from the place where his parents lived, okay? He was exiled from his parents, and he went to the land of Nod. And I wrote this, he appears to have been exiled, for there is no account written of him ever coming back to visit his, apparent, his parents, Cain, like Ishmael, is cast out to dwell away from the family. And you see that pattern. You see that pattern over and over and over. 
Um, and then I put down, but however bad this might have been, there is a worse consequence. It states that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, verse 16. Okay, so he went out from his parents. He was exiled from the family. Um, and I'm sure I put it in here somewhere, but, he, but it doesn't appear that he ever met Seth, who came along later. Um, and worse than that is that his way, his way, this, this way, this way of, of, of Cain, this way of our minds, of our way of dealing with things, uh, we may not see it at times as Cain, but it can very well be that, or can be the way of Cain. And uh, the worst thing I think that could happen to me is that I would be driven out from the presence of the Lord. You know, in fact, it doesn't even say he was driven out. It says he went out. He went out. And, you know, I mean, I want the Lord. And I don't want the Lord for fear of being exiled. I don't ever even think like that. It doesn't come to my mind. I don't live in fear. I don't, I don't think about fear. I think about love. I think about the Lord. I think about him. That um, if, if, if this is the plan, if this is God's plan, that he wants us, he wants our heart, he wants us to be with him in his son, by his son, through his son, then I think the, the cleanest path for that is to make that your heart's desire, to, to press toward the mark, not press toward, you know, not doing things or doing things right or doing things a certain way or, <clears throat> or fearing that, you know, what if I don't make it or whatever. The, the truth is, in the, in the most real sense, none of us make it. Only Jesus does. And we, we are in him, but we are known in son. That's what it says in Hebrews. We are known in son, in the son. And uh, we are known by who then? Who knows us there? Well, the father, the father. And that's, so this, this is not a religious endeavor though religion has made it that. This is not a religious endeavor. This is a heart situation that God started and the father desiring his son to inhabit us and the father desiring an increase of that son ever increasing, ever with, with that, ever increasing is ever desiring ever longing, ever, you know, um, um, being, having your focus readjusted regularly because we do, we do stray, we do get off, we look at other things and things like that. And <clears throat> so the hope of that isn't, well, I'm going to get back and do right. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to cry on this altar and that's going to make everything right. The only thing that, that, moves the father's heart is a heart that's moved toward his son Amen. you know and that really moves his heart and okay so if that's true then um then the law is over with <laughs> the law is over with we're not trying to please god through through thou shalt and thou shalt not and the reason why the law was instituted in the first place was to show that we would never do that based on trying to be religiously right because we'll stray and they stray they did so did Israel and so <clears throat> but it, it's based on finding the heart of God finding but see see if you say that to some people they seek to find the heart of God for them you know uh, I want to know God's love for me I I it's such a lavish love. You know, a whole lot of songs are talking about his lavish love, but it's talking about slathering that on us. 
instead of being recognized in son and knowing knowing the father's heart not just the father's head but the father's heart knowing his heart for his son that that you can't be, you can't get any more secure than being in Christ in his son you can't it is as secure as Christ is because he makes you one with him. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so what we have is uh, Cain going out. He went out from the Lord. And we will see, you know, probably in the next time we get together, we will see how incredibly significant that was. Not just in terms of negative but also what the Lord ends up doing. So no, no line uh, in the word of God is without importance. It has its place. And our heart has to not just read and go, well, I read that. Did you get anything from it? No, but I read it. Well, okay. So, okay. So we should read the Bible, right? Amen. We should read the Bible. We should read the Bible. Okay. But what if you say, okay, I'm going to, I need to, I haven't read the Bible in months or years or weeks, whatever, you know, I, I need to read the Bible. So we get out the Bible and we read it and we read, you know, and we go, man, I'm going to finish this chapter, you know, and we read it and we read it and we read it and we finish that chapter and we go, oh, I feel good. I read, I read, I read the Bible. Well, no, you read a chapter, but you, you read in the Bible. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, if, if the Lord was standing there and said, well, what did you get out of it? You go, well, if you quote the story to him, then it's just a storybook. I mean, Abraham is no different than Abraham Lincoln then. You know what I'm saying? It's just a, it's just a story is what I'm trying to say. It has no spiritual content and therefore, it has no spiritual nutrition. So, if, a, if somebody says, I'm going to read, have you ever seen this Bible? Um, read through the Bible in a year. Okay. Hmm. I, I have nothing to say. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I would, I, would, I would encourage that if you're not reading the Bible at all. I mean... <laughs> You know, yes, go, go, go. Okay. Because, um, you know, your chances of being touched by the Lord are greater at least reading through the Bible than it is, you know, reading through, you know, I, I don't know, People Magazine. Or uh, there's another one called Self. I don't know. So, um so if the Lord said, what did you get out of it? Uh, then it would have been better to pick one verse, not a chapter. Just one verse and read it and go, I didn't get anything. And read it till you get something. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just believe that. I believe that he can, he can use that one. You say, well, that's only some little tiny bit. What about the whole? That's like DNA. It is like DNA, and God can use that one verse and show you all kinds of stuff. Has he ever done that to you? Yes. And you're going, oh, my God. You know, and every time I go back, I, I remember uh, Romans, the sixth chapter was that way for me when I was in Bible school. Every time I read it, I would get something new, and i go, oh, my God. You know, and then i go back and read it again. What? You know? And uh, you can ask Deb, mine was, it wasn't just falling out of my Bible, it was melting from my oils from touching the page as I, I read or wept or whatever when I would see something, and it just melted, the pages just melted. Um, he can just keep at you. He can bring up stuff you can't imagine, but, there, but, but a focus, reading the whole thing is too much. Reading one verse is not too much. And saying, Lord, I want to see you. I want to know you. Open my eyes. How about this? Open my heart. You know. Okay. So, um, 
Um, let's see. All right. So verse 17, you remember that Cain was cursed from the ground, right? Remember in that conversation in some of the, several of the last classes when uh, after he had um, killed Abel, God said that you, the, the ground is cursed because of you. And, um, and meaning it's not going to bring forth. He went on to say it's not going to bring forth. Well, that's, is that interesting? I mean, that's what he brought instead of a lamb. He brought the fruit of the ground, and he gloried in it, and he gloried in what he could produce. And he thought God gloried in it, because that's why he got mad. He thought God was going to go, whoa, dude, look at the size of those pumpkins <laughs> or whatever, you know, look at this, look at this fruit, look, you know. And you go, you missed it. You missed it, you know. Don't offer the fruit of your hands. Offer Christ. And so he went out from the Lord, and the ground wasn't going to produce for him anymore, so he began to build. Okay. He became a builder. All right, well, that's, I think that's in all men. <laughs> we all want to build, you know. But we need to be built. God, the scripture says that we are meant to be a habitation of God, that we are being built together, a habitation of God through the Spirit, and let God be the builder. Uh, what, is, what does that scripture say about whatever a person does, that's God is the one who gives the increase and, you know, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay. Well, a person would say what Cain would say. That's the sad part. He would say what Cain would say, and that would be, look how good this looks, what I built. Look how good this looks. And the Lord would say, or the Spirit would say, except the Lord builds the house, you're laboring in vain. No, this isn't vain. This is really good stuff. Really good stuff. No, no. That's vanity. Well, if we don't take God's view, I mean, and it's not easy because we are by nature fallen unless Christ is formed and governmentally formed, and especially in our mind, let this mind be in you. So, um, he became a builder. And then in verse 17 through 19, basically it's just given the family lineage um, of Cain. And it really doesn't give much explanation. But in verse 20 through 22, then it begins to start giving us some, some more stuff. <clears throat> and um, it, it begins with names in the lineage, but it's also adding occupations. Um, so... What we see that came out of Cain was a bunch of firsts, okay? A bunch of firsts, okay? Anybody want to be first? <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch of firsts, okay? Uh, tent makers, herds, musical instruments, working with copper and iron. Um, that's probably the greatest, um, what would you say, heritage that Cain brought forth in the earth was all these things. And, I, but I want you to think about this because we go, okay, I, I play a musical instrument. So thank you, Cain. Or I've camped. <laughs> and I was in a tent. So thank you, Cain. Or on and on and on. But here's the, here's the thing you have to realize. If God doesn't like it, if it's contrary to the nature of his son and it's just us, then it's what's going to happen to it? Well, it won't stand. You're right. It won't stand the fire, but actually it won't stand the, the flood. All the first were wiped away and somebody else came along and re... 
<laughs> refound that, those things. And the lineage of Cain stopped right there. And all of the firsts stopped and everything ended. <clears throat> all right, so I have, a, I have two of the verses here that I didn't see anything in, so I need your help. I'm going to read it to you, and y'all help me tell me what, what he's trying to say here. This is verse 23 and 20. I'm serious. I, I didn't get nothing. In fact, I wrote, no insight. <laughs> That's what I got in my notes. So I don't, you know, I'd like to know. All right, here we go. <clears throat> verse 23. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Oh, I get it now. Okay, I got something. Woman, you need to listen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hearken unto my speech, for I have, a, I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Anybody, what do you got? Scott. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Is that all we got? <laughs> I couldn't get anything anyway. All right. So, uh, verse 25. <clears throat> and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. Oh, my God, folks. I just want to tell you that this now is fixing to get real, real interesting along the lines of the prodigal son and all that that brought us to. And all that we're going to see now through all of Cain and Abel, we're going to get the whole deal with the firstborn. We're going to really see it. Up to this point, we could kind of see it with Abel, but you sort of had to assume it based on the, the pattern that you see throughout. But now we're going to get it. We're going to see it, and it's going to be glorious. So... <clears throat> um, so Cain left long before Seth was born. And again, we have no record of them ever meeting. Uh, so let me just read this. The birth of Seth is very significant to God's plan for his firstborn. Seth is like the going to be the, the, the fulfilling of what was in God's heart. Okay. When the only sons of Adam and Eve were Cain and Abel, it appeared that God had ordained Abel as the, as, as the firstborn at the time of the sacrifices. But with his death, the place of firstborn was in jeopardy because Abel was killed before he could have any sons. Right? To bring forth. You want, you want to bring forth that firstborn. You want to bring it forth through you. You want it. You want that son manifested. You don't just want to believe in it. And that's, that was Abraham's problem. Yes. But that was also his faith that he believed for. Amen. Okay. So there's no manifestation, but then we get this story. But there's more behind it. <clears throat> um, uh, but with, with his death, with Abel's death, the place of firstborn was in jeopardy because Abel was killed before he could have any sons. Though Abel had no descendants or bloodline, yet according to Hebrews 11.4, his bloodline still speaks. Okay, and we'll see it, see how that um, meshes out. So let's go ahead and read 25 again and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said she, for God said she, do you, do you get this? God said something to her, and she's saying, God said this to me. Okay? Um, for God, said she, appointed me another seed instead of Abel, or in the stead of Abel. In the stead of Abel. Not just in, not less, well, he didn't make it. He died, so that ruined it. But he's... In the stead of Abel. All right. Um, hath appointed me another seed in the stead of Abel, whom Cain slew. 
And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Something's going on, right? Okay. When Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and Abel was dead, Adam and Eve were almost right back to the starting place of the fall when they got rejected and kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And Abel, remember how we talked about the hope yes. and, the, and that when God showed favor to Abel, like when God shows favor to the firstborn in you, it gives you hope. It's Christ yes. in you, the hope of glory, the scripture says. And so... There was so, but when he, when Abel was dead and Cain went out, it's, it's Adam and Eve back, back to the beginning. All right. But also, all those people that, that were in the lineage of Cain, they didn't have the Lord either. Because Cain wasn't the firstborn, and you're not the firstborn, but you had the firstborn in you, and you need to quit trying to be the firstborn and measure up as the firstborn and let him increase in you and trust that he's what the Father wants and that when he shows up, the presence of the Lord shows back up. As long as it's you, have you ever been like that at a certain juncture and you go, where's the presence of the Lord even in me? I don't know what's going on here. Well, he's there. If you're born again, he's there. But your focus has been on the wrong person. It's been on yourself. And he has no reason. The, the, the dove, when Jesus walked into the Jordan River and John the Baptist was there, the heavens opened. All of a sudden, we hear from the Father. The Father speaks, and the Spirit of God shows up, which nobody really knew much about him, like as a dove, and comes down and rests upon Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to rest on in you, is Jesus in you, not you. All those people went down. They did the same thing that John did to Jesus. And they all went down the water and came up and said, baptism is going to do the thing that's going to fix me. No, it doesn't fix you. It just, you know, if you don't understand it, it really doesn't fix you. It just gets you wet. But if you understand it, it's talking about death, burial, resurrection. I am acknowledging I'm not just acknowledging a Christian ritual. I am acknowledging that I went down into death with Jesus and he comes up and he's now my life and he's the one that makes everything different now. I'm not just washed clean. Nowhere in the scripture does it say baptism washes you clean or washes your sins away. The blood of Jesus washes your sins away. It doesn't wash you clean. It is a testimony, a public testimony. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for me personally, and now I come up in newness of life. That's what it says. Buried by baptism into death, raised unto newness of life. That's the point. That's the point. That's the reality. And that's, and, and so, okay, so it's, it's just a ritual, let's all get baptized, it's the Christian thing to do. Oh my God, why do we leave Jesus out of everything? Why is it always about us? Why is it always about religion? Why is it always about some ritual instead of going, man, I am with you, Jesus, I am with you. I want your life and your nature, but, but even maybe even higher than I want, the Father wants you, and the Spirit wants to come down on me, but it's coming down on the, uh, on the Son in me. This is my beloved Son, the Father said. Are you raising your hand, or you just got a little paw? She's sitting there like this, you know. Are you going to claw your way up here? Yes.
which body does the Lord anoint? And then the answer was, it's the body of the crucified. Right. It, just, it feels similar to the spirit of what you're saying. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think the f it's, it's almost like the veil opens and we see a little bit, and then we close it and we live off of that forever or for years. But if it opens a little more, we see it a little more and then more and more. And at first for me, it was, I really saw that the Father wanted the Son. I didn't see the fullness of Christ crucified, that Son yet. But through the scriptures, I kept just seeing it. And I'm going, oh my God, I'm, I'm putting myself in front of the Son it's, it's like the father and the son, and I'm somehow getting in between them and going, hey, hey, help me. Do something for me. Look at me, you know? And he's just like, could you get out of the way? Well, <clears throat> then you realize that it's Christ crucified that he wants because that's the, and we'll see that in this story in a major way. This very thing. But <clears throat> instead of the father saying, could you just get out of the way? He gets us out of the way by putting us into Christ's death. That'll get us out of the way. Okay. I am crucified with Christ. You know. And, the, and then the Lord began to move me into that as I looked at the cross. And I'm like looking at the cross. I'm... I'm seeing Jesus there, and I'm just going, oh, thank you, Lord, and everything. And then all of a sudden, one day I looked, and spiritually, because I was really looking into the scriptures about the cross, but it was the same thing, I was, I went, oh, my God, I'm there. I am there. And I'd never heard, you know, before that from most people that I'd been around about being crucified. Crucified language is in the New Testament, and it doesn't just... In fact, I will tell you something. When the word is used in its various forms, it applies more to us than it does to him. For example, Romans 6.14, when it says, um, I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. Well, we know that's through Christ, right? But the application is, he's not even mentioning Christ's death, but that's where it happens. But it is a direct, I'm telling you, you check it out. <clears throat> crucified language, and that's, what I, that's the way I saw it. I went, oh my God, God's using crucified language for me. And so I, you know, looked it up, and then, then and of course, the word crucified is not the only use. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. I am crucified with Christ. Well, there's crucified. For, um, uh, the old man is crucified. I mean, there, there are so many different ways of saying the death that is supposed to apply to us, that God may receive his son through the offering up of him through us and the offering up of the carcass, the body, not just the spirit, and not just the spirit of the lamb. We are living sacrifices. You ever read that one? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so you say, Randy, why do you get so excited? <laughs> Because I see this stuff and it blows my mind. And I just, it's like, it, oh, it overwhelms me. It doesn't go into my head and I go, okay, one, two, three, four. First of all, when I tried to get it in my head, I couldn't get it. It seemed really like a really complicated math thing or something, you know. And I would, I mean, I remember reading scriptures along those lines other than Romans 6, many other places, and just reading it over and over. And I would have to, I'd, one sentence, I'd read it and go, what? Read it and what? Read it and what? <laughs> I did. I did. Over and over. I mean, one verse, I was just going, what? And then I remembered that the Spirit wanted to reveal Christ. But see, isn't that interesting that it's not just the Spirit will show you the 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 um, 
you know, these great mysteries. The Spirit will show you great mysteries. That's not what he's doing. The Spirit will reveal Christ. Yes, that's a great mystery. Isn't that what it said? This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ in the church. Okay. But Christ was revealed, and what's one with him? Not two. Not two. And that's, that's what has to happen. We need to quit being, not just bride, we need to quit being Christian and become one with Christ. We're not Christ, we'll never be Christ. But he is our life. And he is the son of the Father's love, it says in Colossians. He's the son of the Father's love. It could have said he is the, the greatest manager of the universe that there is, and I've exalted him because there is no greater manager. But he never uses that kind of language. <laughs> he says, this is my beloved son. He says, this is the son of the father's love. It is not religious. It is personal. It is intimate. It is, it flows from heart to heart or it doesn't flow. I mean, have you ever tried to have a heart flow with somebody and it didn't flow? <laughs> it's like, hey, you know, and it's just like, never mind. How are you today? <laughs> All right. What time is it? Gosh. All right, so let me just read this. There's good reason to believe that after failing God in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> Abel's parents were very pleased with him bringing back God's favor. Bringing back God's favor. That's not a God sitting there going, you know, do it right or you won't get any favor. It is God saying, I put my son in you. Let my firstborn go to me out of you. Y'all remember Exodus? <laughs> but that's what it, the first words he said to Moses. He didn't say, go deliver the people and bless them and make them happy. Get him out of bondage. He said, let my son, my firstborn son go. Let him come to me in sacrifice. <clears throat> so let me just see here. Where, uh, yeah. So there's good reason to believe that after failing God in the Garden of Eden, Abel's parents were very pleased with him. Uh, uh, bringing back God's favor. Abel brought it back, not Cain. And because of Eve favoring the secondborn, she sees to it that Abel's line is actually continued through Seth, her third son. She recognized that Abel was the one who brought back God's favor, but it wasn't the full favor. It was sacrificial favor, but there's a manifest favor called manifesting the firstborn son. Let the son go out of you to the father. Um, and then in contrast, Cain's line was wiped out in the flood. Since Abel had no descendants and Cain's lineage stopped at the flood, then only Seth's line continued through Noah. Again, Seth's line was the only one that survived because it went through Noah and his sons. Are you starting to see that this is just like all the other stories and will be like the other stories? Um, this means that Seth was the second father after Adam of the whole race through Noah. 
because he lives, he continue, Abel still lives. We'll explain that. We hadn't got to the explanation of that, but have to set that in your mind before you can see it. And once you set it, you'll go, oh, that's, what it's, that's what's going on here. Um, this means that Seth was the second father after Adam of the whole race. Is this why Eve is called the mother of all living? Because she preserved Abel alive through Seth, the only begotten son that survived? The only that survived. Gosh, it'd be nice. I could probably just, I think I can read this and finish tonight on this right here. Eve's beloved son, Abel. Eve's beloved son was slain, whom was God's beloved son also. At the same time, Cain was lost to Eve because he lived as a wilderness wanderer away from his parents. With Abel's death, it appeared that the world would be populated with people through Cain. Okay. She lost her beloved son. She lost her other son, Cain, who was a wilderness wanderer. Does that ring any bells? <clears throat> And with Abel's death, it appeared that the world would be populated with people through Cain only. So, this lady, the mother of all living, you thought it was... Therefore, Eve set about to bring Abel back. It is as if God and Eve conspired to raise up another son who would take Abel's place. In actuality, he wouldn't take Abel's place. He wouldn't take Abel's place. It would not be Seth instead of Abel. Think about it until I read it here. <laughs> so Abel came forth in resurrection but in a different form. The name Seth implies that he is a substitute in the place of Abel, but is the resurrection version. So Seth stands in the place of the dead son, Abel. She's, he stands in the place of the dead son. He's the resurrection of Seth, if you will. Now, you know what we're talking. We're talking, we're applying this to Christ, not to voodoo or something weird, right? <clears throat> um, so Seth stands in the place of the dead son. It is the dead son that is the beloved son. Amen. Right? Y'all should know that. In his death, Abel carried out the part of the firstborn son in relationship to sacrifice and then a right spirit. So when Eve hugs Seth, she hugs the son that, ga that gave himself. Okay. One little paragraph left. As we noted, Seth became the stand-in for the slain son, but the beloved son was slain by his own brother, just like as it were, Joseph will be slain by his brothers. It won't be all the blessings of Joseph while he's with the father in the father's house. It will be when he's taken to a foreign land and as good as put to death by his own brothers. And there he will be fully slain and come forth. Okay. The beloved son was slain by his own brother, uh, uh, so that out of his death would come forth a multitude through Seth. Everything came through Seth. Noah, his sons, the, a multitude. How about the world population? Right? Uh, it did not happen to Cain or Abel, but through Seth, who represents the resurrected son, which 
are called Shemites. In Seth, God exalts the dead son. All right, so you know, as we've spent much time, and this is my closing, we spent much, much time going carefully through the scriptures, and particularly we saw it in Philippians, where in Philippians 2, the one that God highly exalts is the one who thought it not being robbed to no longer be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. This is the one God exalts. And you see in the book of Revelation, it's the lamb slain that, number one, that is on the throne, not a resurrected, just glorious-looking, radiant, no scars, no nothing. This is, I am the Son of God, the raised Son, and worship me. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, they worship, you check their words, they're worshiping the one that was slain, the lamb that was slain. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to be exalted with glory and honor and blah, 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 blah. everything. Everything. Okay, if that's true, then Seth, with all of this coming forth, and it's all coming forth out of him, and it's all... Let's see. So let me read these two verses together. Um, they're, they're all in chapter 4, but I'm going to read them together. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay. What's Enos? Well, he's the, he's the lion. He's the next. He's the manifestation lion. He's Christ in you being manifested in his nature. It is to God living proof of the firstborn son. It's living proof. So Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord. They, all of his line doesn't have the presence of the Lord. You read it just before Noah that works right up to Noah, which isn't very, doesn't take very long at all. And then there's you know nothing but evil continually in the hearts of men, something like that it says there. But what we find through Noah is one that's looking in the eyes of the Lord, in the face of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He's looking in the face of God. That, this little line, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord, that's where Noah came from. That's where they came from. It's an ongoing picture of Christ and him crucified and Christ being raised, exalted as Christ. Christ crucified, exalted, and raised, and of, of manifestation of that continuing through a multitude, which just that word multitude reminds you of who? Abraham. And that's where we're heading next. Okay, I will have one more short class next time, and then we're going to go into... Abraham, which, you know. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Spirit of God because, Lord, you know that I have been searching these things for my whole life, basically, and, and you've been gracious to show me. But, Father, there are those who are new and hungry and desire you, and I ask you to open your heart, not just your word, but let them see your heart. Let them see this true living thing that's alive, spirit and truth. Jesus, you said your words are spirit and truth, not religion and, and, and meanness. But, and so I ask you, I ask you, Father, to let the Spirit of God open our eyes and our hearts to your heart toward your Son. And in so seeing, 
the Son will be glorified to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.